Hi everyone, I'm Maria McLachlan. Last year, 2021, Arkansas enacted a ban on providing puberty blockers, wrong sex hormones and so-called gender affirming surgeries to young people under the age of 18. The ban was challenged by the American Civil Liberties Union on behalf of some trans identifying kids and their families and a couple of doctors and they won a preliminary injunction against the ban. This case goes to trial this week and a few people have suggested I react to John Stewart's interview with Arkansas Attorney General Leslie Rutledge or rather to the excerpt he posted on his YouTube channel The Problem with John Stewart. Stewart has been widely applauded for putting Rutledge on the spot asking her for her sources for various things she said. Okay, she can be criticised for not being better prepared for the interview, for not anticipating the questions better and for not going in armed with hard stats or names or whatever he might ask for. But the bottom line is that this will be for a court to decide, not John Stewart's fans. And the court will presumably make their decision according to the law and not according to anyone's moral conscience. I understand the case is going before the same judge who ruled in favour of that preliminary injunction. So all in all, I'm not optimistic that Arkansas will win this, but what do I know? I just hope the judge reads Dr Hilary Cass's interim review on gender identity services in the UK, which is the most important contribution to the debate on caring for gender dysphoric young people. In the meantime, I have a few criticisms of John Stewart and a couple of points of my own to make. So let's jump in. Why would the state of Arkansas step in to override parents, physicians, psychiatrists, endocrinologists who have developed guidelines? Why would you override those guidelines? Okay, let's talk about parents first. However much they love their children, parents do not always make the best healthcare decisions for them, even though they think that that is exactly what they are doing. The classic example is of parents who believed the stories about the MMR vaccine causing autism. Of course, you wouldn't want your child to have those jabs if you truly believed there was a chance it would cause a lifelong developmental disability. Thanks to charlatans like struck off Dr. Andrew Wakefield, many do, wrongly. Worse are those who rely on out and out quackery instead of science-based medical treatments. I have a website called discoverhomeopathy.co.uk if you're interested, and it has a page full of stories of lives lost because of a belief in homeopathy. On my old blog, Skepticat UK, I reported on how uh, a couple spurned medical help and relied on the power of prayer to save their 11-year-old daughter. She died of diabetic ketoacidosis and they got convictions for second degree homicide, but who's to say they didn't love her and were only doing what they thought was best. Now, when it comes to transgenderism, we know some parents are emotionally blackmailed by their own children or worse, manipulated by healthcare staff. And we were put down by the hospital staff in front of our daughter, accused of being bigoted, not inclusive and transphobic. We were told that we must accept that we now had a son or she would kill herself. They said, would you rather have a live son or a dead daughter? I'll say something about the suicide risk later. But that's not to say that all parents are innocent. I'll repeat what I've shown in other videos about some parents being so homophobic. I remember even thinking before I was three that I think this kid might be gay. And I thought that that could not happen and that would not happen. So homophobic that they would rather trans their kids, allow their kids to be used as medical experiments than endure having a gay child. 
and at the Tavistock Clinic, professional staff told the Times newspaper that some parents made it obvious that they'd rather have a trans child than a gay child. Enough about parents. Obviously, some of them suck and shouldn't ever have had children in the first place, but most try to do what they believe to be in their children's best interest, even if they sometimes get it wrong. On the transing of children, it's the professionals, the medics and the therapists who are the real charlatans as far as I'm concerned, yet John Stewart seems to think they can do no wrong. You're suggesting that protecting children means overriding the recommendations of the American Medical Association, the American Association of Pediatrics, the Endocrine Society. We don't have enough data. We don't have enough to show that these drugs are effective and that these children are better off and that we should you don't encourage have enough these. Or it's not enough for you. If she's talking about puberty blockers, I'd say we have enough data to know that they are not reversible and they can have catastrophic effects on children's health and lives. There remains a mass of misinformation by hundreds of what appear to be mostly American sources on the web. At least our National Health Service has amended its own misinformation somewhat and is now saying that little is known about the long-term side effects of hormones or puberty blockers in children with gender dysphoria. Let, let, me, let me try and flip it a different way and see if maybe this, this can help. In Arkansas, if you have pediatric cancer, and obviously we all want to protect children, I think we established that earlier, whose guidelines do you follow? How disingenuous, not to mention condescending, is John Stewart being here? Cancer is a physical disease, or rather a group of diseases, Unlike gender dysphoria, it has and continues to be the subject of a massive amount of research. There are long-standing protocols for treating it that have actually proven effective in many cases. More and more people are surviving it. It is not remotely comparable to the phenomenon of physically healthy children and teenagers being distressed about their sex, and I can think of a number of reasons why they would be. I went through it myself as an adolescent, albeit in a very different era. And I can think of a similar number of reasons why the cure for that distress should not be medical interventions that result in irreversible changes to a young person's healthy body. Before she or he is old enough to drive a car, get a tattoo, graduate from high school, vote, join the military or indeed get any kind of job. Uh, in terms of masculinizing top surgery, I think 12 is the youngest who's had surgery through our program. As Abigail Schreier said recently, A sword of Damocles hangs over professionals' heads now. And what it says is, you must agree with the patient's self-diagnosis. Put another way, it, must, it suggests that you should begin with the conclusion. Your conclusion must be that this person has gender dysphoria. And then you can, you know, go along from there and start prescribing treatments. That's not how medicine or any other area, area of therapy is practiced. You don't begin with the conclusion. You investigate it. Here's a press release. The American Medical Association today urged governors to oppose state legislation that would prohibit medically necessary gender transition related care for minor patients, calling such efforts a dangerous intrusion into the practice of medicine. Now, given that what in this press release is called gender transition related care involves irreversible medical interventions on physically healthy people, the obvious question raised is in what possible circumstances can such interventions be medically necessary? There is only one argument that I ever see made for providing either the medications or the surgery, and that is that the physically healthy person that you are turning into a lifelong medical patient is at risk of committing suicide if you don't.
I've got some bad news for you. Parents with children who have gender dysphoria have lost children to suicide. In a nutshell, trans identifying youth need to be medically transitioned to prevent their suicide. Is this true? I don't believe so, and it behooves anyone making this argument, as John Stewart does, to do the research and present the data in support, as John Stewart does not do, so far as I can see. Remember what is at stake here. If you start adolescents on puberty blockers and they go on to take cross-sex hormones, their sexual function will be impaired, they will be anorgasmic and infertile, and there is emerging evidence of other risks of that particular pathway, including osteoporosis in very young people and increased cardiovascular disease in older men. Some girls live to bitterly regret the double mastectomies they get, the facial hair, the baldness and the permanent loss of their feminine voices. Some of those girls and boys who have genital surgery suffer massive life-shattering complications. Now, as far as the suicide claim is concerned, I turn to the excellent website Transgender Trend. At the top of this page, we have a quote from the charity Mermaid, currently under investigation for its deeply unethical practices, saying that the attempted suicide rate amongst young trans-identifying people is 48%. The lower quote is from professional staff at the Tavistock saying suicidality among young people attending the gender identity development service they work at is not higher than those referred to child and adolescent mental health services. It is not helpful to suggest that suicidality is an inevitable part of this condition. So who's right? The 48% figure comes from 27 trans identifying people under the age of 26 who completed a questionnaire and 13 of that 27 reported having attempted suicide at some point in their past. Further down the page of the transgender trend website there is an analysis of this and other studies. A much bigger and more robust study was published in the US in 2018. The results were analysed by Michael Biggs of Oxford University, who found that statistically the group most likely to report a suicide attempt is gender non-conforming females, irrespective of how they identify. Jordan Peterson said in conversation with Helen Joyce recently. When boys and girls are given personality tests before they hit puberty, there's not a lot of difference in average level of negative emotion experienced. But as soon as girls hit puberty, their proclivity to experience negative emotion, so that shame and guilt and disappointment and fear and depression, is elevated markedly in contrast to men. And it's permanently transformed at puberty and it stays stable for the rest of women's lives. And so women reliably experience more negative emotion than men on average. A nationwide survey of Canadian youngsters in 2019 surveyed 6,800 people in the 15 to 17 age group. For 41 out of that number, Researchers used the term transgender because they said their gender identity did not match their sex or they claimed their gender to be something other than male or female. Their rate of attempted suicide was 7.6 times higher than the other 7,659 teenagers surveyed in that age group. What we are not told, or I haven't been able to find out, is how many of those designated transgender were born male and how many were female, how many of them were same-sex attracted and whether they'd actually transitioned socially and or medically or whether they have kept their trans identity to themselves or just their friendship groups rather than being out to their families and everyone else. 
These are important data, but they don't seem to be available to the public, assuming they were collected at all. Out of the non-trans group, same-sex attracted females reported the highest rate of attempted suicide. It has always seemed to me that gender dysphoria in a young person is more likely to be a symptom of unhappiness or anxiety or depression rather than a cause of it. And the more I read from the ever increasing numbers of detransitioners, the more inclined I am to believe that. So many talk about being in seriously unhappy situations, whether due to abuse, neglect, not having supportive families, bullying for being perceived as different, before they ever hit on the idea of reinventing themselves as the other sex. Anyway, Transgender Trend concludes that the statistics for suicide attempts have been exaggerated, but this is a psychologically highly vulnerable population. A young person with mental health problems needs psychotherapeutic support, and a young person who is feeling suicidal needs urgent psychiatric care. Much more research is needed into different care pathways for young people with gender dysphoria. I'll link to that article and every other source I use below. Note that these studies are into self-reported suicide attempts and ideation. Stewart claims young trans-identifying people have actually committed suicide. Well, where are the data? Where are the coroner's reports concluding that the suicides were due to not being allowed to medically transition? as teenagers or younger. If he had looked at the entire body of available evidence, he would find that it does not support that particular claim, or indeed this claim. And so these mainstream medical organizations have developed guidelines through peer-reviewed data and studies. And through those guidelines, they've improved mental health outcomes. One more thing from the AMA press release. Physicians are guided by their ethical duty to act in the best interest of their patients. Oh, is that right? So it's nothing to do with wanting to line your pockets then. Does everyone know about Vanderbilt University Medical Center? There are great profits in lopping off the breasts of young girls, apparently. And as for that shill Dr. Jack Turban and his countless flawed research papers, let's not go there. Somewhere amongst the bits of Stuart's interview with Rutledge, bits I've shown, um, was a bit that really annoyed me. Well, I think it's important that all of those physicians, all of those experts, for every single one of them, there's an expert that says, we don't need to allow children to be able to take those medications. It sounds eminently plausible to me, especially given the emerging evidence of failures of gender-affirming treatments and their abandonment in some countries, that there would be at least as many American doctors who oppose them as there are in favour, if not many, many more. Though, of course, there is always the issue of how brave one has to be to speak out on anything that challenges the cult thinking. I understand it's possible even to lose your license if you do so, which is mind-blowing. But what does John Stewart do? Well, you know that's not true. You, you know it's not for everyone there's one. There's, these are the established... Well, I don't know that, that that's not true. I don't know that... Well, then why, you would know you, that. why would you pass a law then if you, don't, if you don't know that that's true, wouldn't you? You probably spotted what Stuart did here. Rutledge, already put on the defensive, having been effectively called a liar, said she doesn't know that it's not true, as Stuart claimed. As Stuart comes back with, why would you pass a law then if you don't know that it is true, which is not what Rutledge said. Did he genuinely get confused here, or is he just being a clever dick using a patently dishonest rhetorical device to wrong foot Rutledge? You decide. Next, she says, 
Well, I know so. that there are doctors and that we had plenty of people come and testify before our legislature mm -hmm. who said that, uh, you know, we have 98% of the young people who have gender dysphoria, right. uh, that they are able to move past that. And once they have the, the help that they need, no longer suffer from gender dysphoria. 98% wow. without uh, that medical treatment. That's, that, an, that's an, so, an incredibly made up figure. So he calls her a liar again. That's, that doesn't comport with any of the studies or documentation that exists from these medical organizations. Hmm. The rate of desistance is quite notoriously hard to know and a subject of considerable controversy. This very informative paper published in 2019 and entitled Deficiencies in Scientific Evidence for Medical Management of Gender Dysphoria, and which, by the way, gives the lie to the impression John Stewart gives that the data we have is sufficient, the doctors are right, and the rightness of the gender affirmative models is established. This paper linked to the three most recent papers at that time and said the desistance rate was nearly 85%, but the most recent of those papers was published in 2011. So considering what's been happening in the past 10 years, this figure needs to be treated with caution. Knowing of the huge rise in adolescents claiming a transgender identity and particularly given the phenomenon of rapid onset gender dysphoria caused by social contagion, it is surely plausible that the desistance rate will still be very high. In any event, it doesn't matter. If you have any kind of a moral conscience, given what we are increasingly discovering about this phenomenon, which is that we are very far from a situation where every single person who goes down the path of medical transition, even those who do so in full adulthood, ends up totally happy for the rest of their lives, however short those lives may be. It's not happening. Harms from medical transition are becoming ever more apparent. It seems to me to be a no-brainer that where there is a risk of regret or a negative impact on the young person's short or long-term physical health or well-being, you don't give them irreversible treatments. It's not progressive and it's not humane. It's lunacy and John Stewart should be ashamed of himself. I'll leave you with a few words from Joey Mazar, who regrets her transition. That's all. I'm angry. What's going to happen to the kids and the youth? And there's so many, like, there's so many people who regret this. So... But I'm sad for humanity and the children and what's going to happen when they're screwed up. We're going to see what's going to happen. And I really, really hope that all these professionals get their friggin' karma because I know that some of them don't realize and some of them might be brainwashed and whatever, but some of them know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. Cash cowin'.